We're going to have a Bible reading at this stage of our meeting, and then we'll pray together, and then uh, bring the Word of the Lord. But first of all, it's the little book of Titus in the New Testament. We're going to read a few verses from Titus, and then a few verses from Matthew. So Titus, there's 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and then Titus just after Paul's letters. Five books beginning with the letter T. It's one of those books that's sometimes difficult to find. So it's Titus uh, just before Philemon and the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1 and then a couple of verses from Matthew 15. But we'll read from verse <coughs> number 9 of Titus chapter 1. And I really want you to uh, think carefully about these words as we read them. And then as we bring the message later on, Titus chapter 1, verse number 9. <clears throat> Speaking of the bishop or the elder of the church, it says he is to be a man holding fast the word, the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they that are of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be found or may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. And then there's a verse, a lot like verse 16 of Titus 1 over in the Gospel of Matthew, when our Savior said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 and verse number 9. These words are taken from the prophecy of Isaiah and were spoken by the Savior himself as he spoke to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the religious crowd. He's not addressing those outside of the temple or outside of the synagogues. He's addressing people that are deeply religious, people that know something about what the Scriptures would teach. And the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 15, verse 8 and verse 9 said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart, their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We know God will bless the reading of His Word tonight. Christianity, if it is anything, is a religion of the heart. Solomon said, my son, give me thy heart. I wonder tonight, does God have your heart, your love, your devotion, your surrender, and your affections? If he does not have the heart, he doesn't want anything else. He wants our hearts and our lives. Let's pray together that the Lord will speak to us as we consider this solemn word, honoring Christ with our lips, but our hearts far from Him, professing to know God, but in works, in lifestyle, denying Him. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice tonight that we have the Word of God in a language that we can understand, and we thank the Lord for the person and work of the Holy Spirit, who opens the Scriptures to our hearts and guides us into all truth. 
and seeks to exalt and uplift the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us. Lord, we're in a very solemn subject tonight. We pray for thy help to rightly divide the word of truth and to receive, as Peter said, with meekness, the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. Make us tonight to be honest and open before God. Help us, Lord, to be real. Make me real, O God. And grant tonight, Lord, that there will be judgment day honesty as we sit around the word of life. I pray now for thy help. I pray that you will hide me behind the cross. I pray for the infilling and the anointing of the Spirit of God so that Christ alone will be uplifted and exalted. May the preacher's name and the Minds of men be forgotten, but may the word of God be lifted up and may the Savior speak to us. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and worthy name. He alone is Lord, and we pray that he alone will be uplifted and glorified just now. Answer prayer. We ask these things for the Savior's sake. Amen. I want to speak tonight uh, a message that I know will not be popular a message that might even be hated and perhaps even misunderstood. But I bring this message tonight because I believe that at the juncture we are at as a church in this land and also in the West at large, that this message tonight is vital. It is my deep-seated conviction that there is a blight in our land and in our churches tonight. And by the word blight, I mean a prevalent decay that will ultimately result in destruction. This blight, I believe, is doing more harm to the souls of men and women and young people, especially within our churches, than the cults are doing. This blight that I want to speak about tonight is doing more harm than secularism is doing in our society. You see, every year, year upon year, I hear so many stories of people who have succumbed to this blight and has left them in a very dangerous and precarious place spiritually. I want to speak tonight upon the blight of easy believism. I'm not sure if that is a term that you're familiar with, the term easy believism. Some people would talk about cheap grace or perhaps mere profession, having a head knowledge, having a connection with Christianity, having a profession of Christianity, professing to know Christ, professing to be saved, but all the while our hearts far from God, maybe a million miles away from truth, or in works and in lifestyle denying Him. The blight of easy believism. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible is abundantly clear that salvation from the power and the penalty and the pollution from sin, salvation is by God's grace alone. It's found in Christ and in Christ alone. It is received by faith and by faith alone, and it is not of works lest any man should boast. And let me say as well that the message of the gospel is a simple message. Paul summarized the gospel message in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he says, This is the gospel by which ye are saved, and wherein ye stand. This is the gospel which ye have received. This is the gospel that I declared unto you. And then he recaps what the gospel message is, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Scriptures and the reason why he died was because of our sins and for our sins. That is the gospel message. And that essentially is a simple message. Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for our sins. 
And then the demands of the gospel are simple as well, easy to be understood. In the gospel of Mark chapter 1 and in verse number 15, we read about the Savior entering out into His earthly ministry, His earthly preaching ministry. And His message was very simple, repent and believe the gospel. The message of John the Baptist was similar, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that is our response to the gospel message, repentance and faith, two sides, as it were, of the same coin. So the gospel message is simple. The demands of the gospel are simple and easy to be understood. But coming to Christ is not necessarily easy. In the gospel of Luke, the disciples asked the Lord an all-important question. They came to the Lord and they said unto him in Luke chapter 13 and verse 23, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive. Now this is speaking to his disciples, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. He used the word strive. That means with all of your endeavor, with effort and with assurance and with conviction, strive. Make it your chief aim, your chief purpose to be earnest in coming to Christ. And then, having come to Christ, living the Christian life while it is a joy and while it is filled with peace and assurance, living the Christian life is not easy either. The apostle said in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22 that, it is through much tribulation or trial that we at last enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the gospel message is simple. The demands of the gospel are simple, faith and repentance. Coming to Christ it might be difficult. As the hymn writer said, there might be fightings within and fears without and pressure, peer pressure not to come to Christ. And then taking up the cross and living the Christian life is oftentimes difficult. But with all of that said, we are living in a day and in a generation where there is a new breed of Christianity, especially in the West, right across Europe, right across Britain, and right across the Atlantic into North America, a new breed of Christianity. A Christianity made easy. A Christianity that pays, now this is an important statement, a Christianity that pays lip service to the work of the Savior for the sinner, but completely ignores the work of the Spirit in the sinner. A Christianity, a new breed of Christianity, that pays lip service to the work of the Savior on the cross for the sinner, but completely undermines or ignores the work of the Spirit in the sinner. And those two things are vital. We need to understand what Christ did on the cross, and we need to understand how the Spirit of God Himself applies that to the life of an individual. And the result is, with this new breed of Christianity, it is a Christianity that does not change a person's life, does not change a person's desire, does not really change a person's thinking about certain things, and does not, sadly, change their behavior. And if it doesn't change those things, it does not change their eternal destiny. The Apostle Paul said in those marvelous words that are so far-reaching, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Is that your experience tonight? Have you been made a new creature? Have you been born again? Has your life been radically altered by Christ entering in, changing you? Or have you succumbed to this blight, perhaps, of easy believism, 
and you've got a mere profession, a mere profession, but no real heart for Christ or for the things of God. The Savior spoke to the religious crowd in his day here in Matthew 8, 15 and uh, verse number 8 and number 9, and he says, here's the people, and they draw nigh to me with their mouths, with their lips. They're found amongst religious people. They endorse religious things. They believe certain truths. They say the right things. They have the scriptures in their hands. But the heart, he says, the heart is all wrong. The heart is far from me. As we speak tonight on this subject, the blight of easy believism, I want very briefly to give you a definition of what easy believism is. A definition of easy believism. Easy believism offers cheap grace. A salvation that will take you to heaven without calling for a person to surrender their life to God. A salvation that deals with sin's penalty, but does not save you or release you from sin's power or even from sin's pleasure. A salvation that calls for no surrender or no commitment to really following after Jesus Christ. All that is required is a mental assent to the truths of the gospel and a call for people to simply believe. I've heard people say this, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. My conviction, the most wonderful verse perhaps in all of the Bible, summarizing the message of Scripture, summarizing the gospel, the love of God, it's all there. But people say, well, do you believe that? Do you believe that God sent the Son? Yes, I do. Well, then put your name in. And if you can put your name in that verse, then you're saved and you can go on your way. Or stay behind and pray the sinner's prayer. Or simply ask Jesus into your heart. Because the Bible says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we say it so easily and so flippantly. And we forget that the Philippian jailer to whom those words were spoken was a man who was broken by his sin. A man who was at his wit's end. A man who was desperate to have what the Apostle Paul and Silas and other believers had. A man that wanted to be saved, not just to get to heaven someday, but a man who wanted his life to be changed by the grace of God. And whenever Paul and Silas saw, here's a man who's in earnest, Here's a man who's desperate. Here's a man who's broken. They were able to point him to Jesus Christ and he could be saved from sin. But the reality is that there are multitudes of people, I am convinced, in our world tonight, in our society tonight, in our town tonight, and they have prayed the sinner's prayer. They have made perhaps a profession of faith. They have said the magic words. They've put up their hand perhaps at the end of a meeting but they have never really understood the gospel. And that's a remarkable thing to say. They've heard so much about the love of God, and it's wonderful to think about the love of God. But they have never understood the holiness of God, and the justice of God, and the righteousness of God, and why Jesus Christ had to suffer and bleed and die upon a cross, and what the implications of Calvary and coming to Christ really are. And the result is that you have people who say they believe, but their nature, their hearts have never, never been changed. Titus speaks there in Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. And they might believe in grace, but they do not believe in a grace that changes the will, changes the life, changes the desires. That's what we mean by easy believism, a definition of easy believism. Let me say another thing about easy believism, the dominance of easy believism. Easy believism, mere profession, Counterfeit conversions are nothing new. They were prevalent in the, Old Test in the Old Testament and they were certainly prevalent in the New. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 13, the Lord Jesus Christ 
told the story about a sower. He says, behold, a sower went to sow. And he indicates that that sower represents the person who spreads the word of God. He says, the seed is the word of God. And as he went out to sow, some of the seed fell on the wayside, on the pathway, and it just sat on the surface. And then the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And then some seed fell upon stony ground, shallow, shallow soil, maybe just half an inch thick and a slate bed below it. And it took root and it sprang up quickly. But as soon as the sun rose up and the heat of the day came, it withered. And then some fell among thorns that endured for a little bit longer. And then the thorns grew up and they choked the word so that it became unfruitful. And then some fell upon good soil and took root and brought forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some one hundredfold. And the thing that differentiated the good soil from the other soil types is that that was the only type of soil that produced fruit. The stony ground and the thorny ground, there was results. There was something to show for the sowing of the seed. There was an excitement that says with joy they received the word. But it withered quickly and it perished. And then the Lord went on to speak about the sheep and the goats. They look the same in that part of the world. And the wheat and the tares, they grow together until harvest. And they look the same. And then he talks about the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. They were all waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. They were all sitting in the same place. They were all dressed the same way. But half of them weren't even ready. They didn't have oil in their lamps. Inside those lamps, there were, there were, they were empty. And the oil speaks of the Spirit of God. And then you read as well about Judas Iscariot. Now, if you took any of those groups of people that the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking about, the evangelical church today would bring them into membership in a heartbeat, supposing that they are all authentic, real, genuine believers in Jesus Christ. The sad fact of the matter is that the church in the West that is so bent on entertainment and numbers and getting people in at all costs is virtually devoid of any type of spiritual or biblical discernment. I hear people sometimes talking about people getting saved, and we rejoice to hear of people getting saved. But so often the numbers are so clinical and so flippant. Oh, there was, there was a meeting there and there were 30 people saved. Or 50 people. Or last year there was number of people converted. And you ask, well, what's your criteria for saying that these people were genuinely converted? And it literally means, well, they prayed a prayer. They put up their hand. They were counseled. They said, yes. They said, I do. They repeated the magic formula. And numbers are touted, and people boast about professions and conversions and salvation. But strip it all back. And strip it all back and get right to the core issue. And look for lasting fruit that remains fruit unto God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, growth, development, surrender, commitment, consecration. And you ask, where are the people that were really converted, really saved? P.T. McRosty was a Scotch preacher. He preached in the tent hall in Glasgow, Scotland. Whenever Jock Troop was a young man, some of you know Jock Troop. There's a book about him called The Revival Man. Jock Troop shadowed alongside him and evangelized with him. There's a book out about P.T. McRosty himself. It's called The Man Who Walked Backwards. Often in Glasgow, they would have an open-air march of witness, and they would evangelize, and they would go along, and P.T. McRosty would lead the procession, but keep his eye on the procession, and he'd walk up the street backwards as he led in singing and song. And that man's ministry was greatly owned and blessed of God. So much so that during a number of years, there were a lot of people who professed salvation under his ministry. And he was often asked the question, how many people were saved? But he himself always referred to people who were counseled as people who made professions. 
And whenever he was pressed, how many people have got saved, he generally answered that question with this statement. Come back to me in a year's time, and I will know better their reality and their sincerity. Come back in a year's time, and I will know better their reality and their sincerity. You say, was he a skeptic? Did he not believe God could save and God was moving? He did believe that, but he was not foolish either. He was a man who knew what the Scriptures taught, that many shall say, Lord, Lord, and it's mere profession. The Reverend Duncan Campbell of the Faith Mission, so used of God in revival, in his day and generation, way back in the 1960s, made this statement about Christianity in England. He says, Our crusades are producing nothing more than harvests of infidels. Think of it. Evangelical, fundamentalist, Bible-preaching churches, he says, our crusades are producing nothing more than harvests of infidels. You see, if you read the life of Duncan Campbell, whenever he was converted, he went off to France and he fought in the First World War and he learned there some valuable lessons. One evening before going out to a particular battle where the life expectancy of a soldier on the front line was something like a maximum of 13 minutes. They were all afraid. They knew that the majority of the platoon wouldn't be coming back alive. And the night before that great battle, five young men who knew Mr. Campbell was a Christian came and they spoke to him and they said, we want to get saved. And he gladly led them to the Savior. The next night, out of the five, only two came back alive. Duncan Campbell sent a messenger. says, send for those two men that have been spared. And we'll pray and thank God for sparing your lives. And whenever that young messenger found those two young men, they had broken into the rum supplies and they were rolling about the floor in laughter. And whenever they, the young man says, Mr. Campbell, Duncan wants you to come, and he wants to hold a prayer meeting along with some others to thank God for sparing your lives. You know what they said? They says, tell him to take his prayer meeting to hell. And 24 hours before that, they were seeking God for salvation. What were they saved from? I ask you tonight, what are you saved from? You ask the average Christian today, what are you saved from? I'm saved from hell. Is that it? By and large, yeah. What takes you there? Sin. Are you saved from sin? Or just its consequences? Are you saved from self? Do you recognize that Jesus Christ is King, Lord, as well as Savior and Mediator and Advocate? What are you saved from? Are you saved from bad manners? Are you saved from lies and deceit? Are you saved from self-will and self-seeking? You see, it is only natural if a person believes that there's a hell that they want to be saved from it. But it is entirely supernatural for a person to be want to be saved from their own self-will and their own pride and their own way and their own sin. Anybody who knows that there's a hell wants to be saved from it. The thief upon the cross who didn't repent said, Lord, if or if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. It was nothing more than self-preservation. Wanted to be taken out of that situation of suffering and pain, but just as long as I can go back to living the same way I was living before they nailed me to this cross. Then what are the deficiencies of easy believism? The overriding characteristics of the modern gospel can be clearly seen not in what it believes, but in what it lacks. We can be fooled into thinking, well, there's a church, or there's a person, there's a preacher, there's an evangelist, he believes in the Trinity, he believes in the Bible, he believes in the death and the resurrection of Christ, uh, he, he, he believes in the sin nature, he believes all of these wonderful things. And he would need to. But you can stop short by making mental assent to those truths. Take the modern gospel to the Scripture, the easy believism gospel to the Bible, the new breed of Christianity to the Word of God, and I submit to you tonight that it's deficient. There's lacks with it, things that are missing. 
And we could summarize its deficiencies under several headings. Easy believism presents decisions without discipleship. Decisions without discipleship. Now, I have no problem with the word decision. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Moses said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? Pilate said, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? I have no problem with the word decision and the principle of somebody deciding for Christ. But I have a big problem with decisionism without discipleship. Did you know that the word Christian is found three times in the Bible? The first record is in Acts chapter 11, 26. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And then later on, King Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to become or to be a Christian. And then Peter said, If any man suffer as a Christian. And whenever you take those three references together, you understand what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who has become a Christian and is living the Christian life. Maybe somebody who suffers for the fact that they're a Christian. And as well, a Christian is a disciple. The word disciple denotes discipline. It really is the same word for student or for learner. So whenever a person has decided, I, I want to become a Christian under grace and under God and the Spirit of God has moved in them, that therefore should lead to a life of discipleship, following on to know the Lord. The Savior said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But are you following the Lord tonight? Decisions without discipleship? And then another point is remission from sin without repentance of sin. Remission of sin without repentance from sin. You know, there are some people and they say, there is no need for repentance. You go onto the internet, go onto YouTube, and type in what it means or how to become a Christian. And there's so much confusion out there as to how to actually come to know Christ and to know sins forgiven. Some say, well, it's by faith alone, and if it's by faith alone, we don't need repentance. Some will even go as far as saying the word repentance isn't mentioned in the Gospel of John, therefore it's not necessary, and it's not relevant at all. Others will say, well, the word repentance means to change your mind, and yes, it means that in part, and therefore it's just changing what you believe. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except ye repent, Luke 13, 3, ye shall all likewise perish. The first word in his earthly ministry was the word repent. Repent and believe the gospel. His last word to the church in Revelation 3 was the word repent. In his glorified state, he called people to repentance. The word repent means to turn to have a change of mind, yes. But if I'm going the wrong direction and I realize, listen, I'm on the wrong road. I, I meant to head for Belfast, but instead I'm heading up uh, towards Limavady or towards Londonderry. I'm going the wrong direction and I change my mind. That change of mind means nothing if I don't change direction with it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth, and forsaketh it, shall find mercy. And whenever a person comes to Christ, of necessity they have to leave other things behind. You couldn't come to this meeting tonight without leaving your home. I can't go to Belfast without leaving Coleraine. I can't go to England without leaving Northern Ireland. And a person can't come to Christ unless they're willing to leave something behind. But nowadays we have remission of sin without repentance from sin. Another mark of easy believism is we have a cross without a crucifixion. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, the Lord Jesus Christ 
spoke to us, and he said emphatically there, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What is a disciple? Well, we've said already a disciple is a Christian. And then he says in the next verse, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Counting the cost. Now salvation is a free gift but there's a cost involved in repenting of sin. That's the only thing it costs is your sin. But that's why it's salvation, because it's deliverance from sin, a Christianity, a, cr a cross without a crucifixion. A.W. Tozer said, it is relatively easy to get people to a cross, but a cross that leaves them uncrucified. And no longer for the Christian does the old rugged cross have a wondrous attraction, but now it needs to be a velvet cross that's easy to carry. Tozer said there are three things about a man on the cross. One, he's no future plans of his own. Two, he's facing one direction. And three, he knows that there's no going back. Is that your experience in Christianity? You're facing one direction. You have no future plans of your own you know that there's no going back. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Legally, my sins are nailed to the cross, but experientially, I am crucified with Christ. And then this gospel of easy believism presents Christian liberty without Christ's lordship. Have you ever heard the statement made, you can take Jesus Christ as Savior, but you don't have to take him as Lord. That's a popular statement in modern circles. Well, you've trusted Christ as Savior. But if you feel there's something lacking in your Christianity, you might want to take that second step and trust Him as Lord as well. As if there are two kinds of, two kinds of roads that lead to heaven. But Paul asks the question, is Christ divided? What did Paul say to the penitent jailer when he said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The penitent thief said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Word of God, whenever it presents Christ, a Savior always uses the word Lord as well. Hudson Taylor said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. We have a, a pretense today of Christian liberty. And whenever you find out what it is, rather than being liberty from sin, liberty not to sin, very often it's paraded as liberty to sin. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, and, uh, uh, and we can sin and we can live whatever way we please. And we don't have to recognize Christ as Lord. It's also presented as salvation without sanctification. There are two principal parts to salvation. Justification, which is an act. Sanctification, which is a work. Whenever God justifies a sinner, he legally declares them forgiven, pardoned, and righteous before the judgment bar of God. But that always comes with sanctification. Sanctification is a work, a growing in grace, dying more and more unto sin, living more and more unto righteousness, and both of them go together. You will never find one without the other. They're two sides of the same coin. In the same way, faith and repentance are two sides of the one coin, and it's, a, it's impossible to have a one-sided coin. And then another point is there's doctrine without devotion. As long as you can say yes to certain doctrines and certain truths, it doesn't really matter if your life's surrendered or devoted to Christ or not. But whenever Simon Peter denied the Lord with oaths and with cursings and was broken over that, the Savior came to him and three times said, Simon, thou son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He didn't say, do you believe certain truths about me? Do you believe I'm the Messiah? Do you believe that I died? Do you believe that I rose again? And if you can tick all the boxes and say, yes, it's all all right. No, he said, Simon, do you love me? Do, you do, do I have your heart? D do you love me, Simon? And that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to love him. Devotion. Do you love him tonight? If you love me, he said, keep 
my commandments. You might have seen in the headlines in the past week a NFL football player plays for the, or did play for the San Francisco 49ers, Colin Kaepernick. Two years ago, there was a whole furore that he wouldn't stand for the singing of the American national anthem. And whenever the anthem came on, he bowed his head and he kneeled down and he refused to sing. And other people joined with him. And this was a, a protest against police violence to the African-American community. Probably has a strong point there. Don't know what his motives were, whether he was trying to garner a little bit of publicity or whatever it was. But he went on to resign from the NFL, opted out of his contract. But just during the week there, Nike in their 30th anniversary of their advertising campaign, Just Do It, they have Colin Kaepernick on one of their posters and then these words written below it. And this really spoke to me. Believe in something. Full stop. Even if it means sacrificing everything. Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. And the idea here is a man who believed something. And he was willing to sacrifice a lucrative career playing for the San Francisco 49ers in the NFL. And I read that statement, and I think here we are as professing Christians. And we profess to believe that the Son of God Himself, the Creator of the universe, died on a cross and shed His blood for our sins. But we're not willing to sacrifice anything, let alone everything. And so you see, friends, the whole contradiction with this whole idea of just believe and then the rest of your life's your own. Devotion or doctrine without devotion. Then also heaven. Heaven without holiness. You know, I believe tonight that most evangelicals would hate heaven because all of the things that they love most are in this world. The hymn writer said, the men of grace have found glory begun below. What he meant by that was Whenever a person is saved, before they enter into heaven, heaven enters into them. And heaven is described in the Bible as that holy city, New Jerusalem. But now you can have heaven without holiness. You see, friends, what I'm saying is this. Simply because we profess or somebody professes or prays a prayer or sticks up their hand is not a guarantee of salvation. Salvation is not a get out of jail free card. Salvation is being changed by the grace of God. Having something, and it's never what it should be this side of eternity, but something of a love and a desire for Christ. And something of a desire to live a life that glorifies Him, a life that is holy. <laughs> Johann Tetzel in the Reformation, or just before the Reformation, sold his indulgences. Do you remember he went around, some of you know a little bit of the history of the Reformation, went around with his box of indulgences, and if you purchased an indulgence, it either took a bit of your time off purgatory, or if you bought it for somebody else, a little bit of their time off purgatory. And then the problem was that lots of people were buying these indulgences as licenses to sin. And so they would buy the indulgence, and then they would commit the sin that they want to commit, and then they'd give the indulgence back in, and it was a token for sin. And men like Luther were repulsed by this. But the reality is that we have the same principle in evangelical circles. That we use grace as a license to sin. Rather than experience grace giving us deliverance over sin. Moving on, the deception of easy believism. It is my conviction that there will be many people in hell that never expected to be there. Expect it perhaps to be in heaven. And for that reason, the Word of God, and if you're taking notes tonight, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Galatians 6, 7, Ephesians 5, 6, James 1, 26, speak about self-deception. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Be not deceived, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God and the children of disobedience. 
If any man among you seem to be religious, but bridleth not his own tongue, he deceiveth his own heart, and his religion is vain. Why does the New Testament warn us about self-deception? Because the heart, Jeremiah says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And many are deceived by easy believism. I was speaking to a lady a good while ago, lovely Christian woman. And I have known something of her, one of her, her family, two of them are saved, and one of them says he's backslidden. I've known him for about 20 years. And in that 20-year period, now he's younger than me, in that 20-year period, he doesn't go to church, doesn't read his Bible, doesn't pray, lives for himself, lives, uh, drinks a lot, sleeps around, all the rest of it. And one day his mother challenged him about this. He says, if you die, what's going to happen? You know what he said? He says, I'm going to be in heaven. And she knows his lifestyle, and she was surprised by this. And she says, how can you be so sure you'll be in heaven? And he says, because whenever I was a lad of six or seven, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and that covers it all, and I'll be in heaven. Friends, do you see how dangerous this is? There's much more to salvation than just getting to heaven. Heaven is a fringe benefit. I've got friendly in town with a Roman Catholic lad from just outside of Derry. Doesn't profess to be a Christian, but he respects whenever you talk about those things. He's not antagonistic. But he said this to me a, a few years ago. He says, all around this town, he says, I never had this in the community I grew up in, but all around this town, he says, I get people coming up to me and saying, you need to get saved. And he says, that might be right, but he says, you know, the thing is, the people that are telling me that I need to be saved, they're the ones that are taking the drugs. They're the ones that are sleeping around. They're the ones that are drinking. They're the ones that are cursing and swearing and blaspheming. And they come and they tell me that I need to get saved and start going to their church. He says, I just can't understand this. And I says, well, you're, Johnny, you're right not to understand it. You would know that if you were going to get saved and come to Christ, that that would indicate big changes in your life. He says, I know that. But he says, these people are telling me this and it just doesn't add up. And so the outsiders see the folly of it and the fraud of it and the insiders fall for it hook, line, and sinker. You know, you can deceive yourself, you can deceive others, but you can't deceive God Almighty. At the end of John chapter 2, we read about many people who wanted to follow Christ. Believe on him. You know what it says? But he did not commit himself unto them because he knew what was in man. He knew that they were just jumping in the bandwagon because it was trendy and everybody else was doing it. But he knew their hearts have never been changed. They don't love me. They don't want to repent of their sin. And so he didn't get excited about it and commit himself unto them. That's why the Bible says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Let a man examine himself. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You say, how do I examine myself? Well, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 7, 16 through 20, you shall know a tree what sort it is by its fruit. Our neighbors have an apple tree. Do you know how I know it's an apple tree? It's not rocket science. Apples grew on it. You can tell a pear tree quite easily. Do you know how? Not by taking it off to a, a lab and conducting some scientific experiments on it. It'll produce pears. A fig tree will produce figs. An orange tree, oranges. A cherry tree, cherry. A plum tree, plums. A tree is known by its fruit. The Savior says you can tell what the root is by the fruit that's produced. He says a corrupt tree, corrupt fruit. A good tree, good fruit. What happens whenever you squeeze an orange? Orange juice comes out of it because that's what's inside. And whenever you really squeeze somebody, what's on the inside will come out. Christ said the fruit of the Spirit is love. First and foremost to God, God's people, and those outside. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, 
temperance, love. Years ago in the church I was brought up in, I think I've told this before, but we were having children's meetings. It illustrates a point. This little girl came in with her friends, singing all the old hymns, Jesus loves me, this I know, wide, wide is the ocean. And then all of a sudden the meeting was interrupted by an irate mother who burst into the meeting, stopped the meeting, stopped the guy at the front, roared and shouted and cursed and swore, and she was furious, she was irate. What had happened was that that little girl had tagged along with the crowd, unknown to her mother, left the housing estate that she was in, crossed the busy street, went into the church hall and sat down and her family didn't know where she was. And of course, like any loving mother, she thought the worst and she was furious that these people had, I suppose, taken her in. This was way back years ago before you had consent forms and things and she had just tagged along with the crowd and she was sitting there and she was merrily singing her heart out, not knowing all the while that sitting in the church she was hopelessly lost. And I've often thought about that. Isn't that just like so many people today? They merrily tag along with the crowd and go along the church, not realizing perhaps that all the while they're lost in church. The deception of easy believism. Lastly, time is well gone. The danger of easy believism. You know, some of the most solemn words in the Word of God are right at the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, that begins, blessed Blessed, 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 but ends with the parable of the two builders. One built his house on the rock, one built his house upon the sand. And just before the Lord told that parable, he said, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He says, Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in your name and prophesied in your name and in your name done many wonderful works? And he says, well, I'm going to have to say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. Now, those are frightening words for any Christian, but look at them, look at them carefully. All they did was talk about what they had done. They never talked about what Christ had done. We have done this, we have done this, and we have done this. And furthermore, the Lord says, listen, you didn't leave your sin, you didn't depart from iniquity. You didn't do the will of your Father which is in heaven, and you didn't know me. And it shows us that they succumb to the same thing. The thing that James spoke about when he says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? There's a danger with easy believism, a danger to those who embrace it. A.W. Pink relates a story of traveling up to Newfoundland on a ship, and he says all of a sudden a storm of wind arose, and the ship was, was battered and, and beaten, and, and everybody was terribly afraid, and they battened down the hatches. The stewards on the ship continually were bringing bad reports. He says strong, brazen men turned pale with fear, the winds increased, the storm rose, and he says, I watched as scores, and he quotes, I watched as scores of men and women called upon the name of the Lord for mercy. And then he asked the question, did he save them? He says, two days later, whenever the weather had changed and the sea was once again calm, the same men were back drinking, cursing, and playing their cards. But they called upon the Lord to save them from the penalty of their sin, but not from the power of it. It poses a danger to those who embrace it. It imposes a danger to those who witness it. More people out there are turned off authentic Christianity because they see the wheat and they see the tares, and they focus on the tares, and they can't see the wood for the trees. You know, Zacchaeus, what his main problem is? He couldn't see Christ for the press. That's why he had to climb a tree. The crowd that thronged around Christ were, in fact, the people that hid Christ from him. And that problem is prevalent in our world tonight. We honeymooned in Canada. We were in uh, Vancouver Island, 
And I was excited to try and see as much wildlife as I could. We'd seen some deer. We'd seen some elk. We had seen some, uh, I don't know what they were, like uh, gophers or groundhogs up in the mountains. We had even seen some bears. But I wanted to see a moose. You know, the big moose, the big long nose and the big antlers and stuff and the big skinny legs. And we were driving up to a place called Port Hardy along this big freeway and there was this big, big pasture and trees in the background and just out of the corner of the eye, I was delighted to see what I thought was a moose. First and only one we've seen in the whole time we were in Canada. Getting onto a ferry, traveling up through Canada, we met a couple from Michigan, lovely people, Christian people, Lutherans, and we got talking about our trip and we got talking about wildlife and he says, what have you seen? And I said, I've seen this, that and the other. And there were dolphins swimming up the side of the ferry as well. And then I said to him, and I even seen a moose. He says, where did you see it? I says, just about maybe 20 miles south of Port Hardy and along that freeway. He says, was it just before such and such a place? I says, yeah, that's it. He says, we seen it too. That's amazing. You've seen the same moose that we seen? Yeah because it's just a plywood silhouette way back off the road. And it's enough to fool people. It's sort of just long grass, and you can just see its head and its antlers. But it's not the real thing. What you saw was just a silhouette, a facade, a fraud, and you were deceived. And the danger of this counterfeit, easy believism, mere profession gospel, is that people outside see it. They deem it to be the real thing, and like Gandhi, the Indian ambassador, they close the Bible and they put it to one side and they think the, they think the whole thing's a fraud. Because they've been looking at people who throng Christ and they do not really know him. Can I ask you tonight in closing, have you got the real thing? Have you? Are your sins really forgiven? Is there assurance in your heart of salvation? Do you love Jesus Christ at all? Now, some Christians will struggle and say, well, I don't love him enough. But do you love him at all? Have you got any faith and trust and desire for Christ at all? Because if you haven't, something is radically wrong. I trust tonight that God will write his word upon our hearts. Let's sing together. Uh, a hymn as we close our meeting. Again, time has gone on a lot longer than usual, but I feel that we needed to deal with this subject without breaking it and spend time considering what the Bible teaches. 480, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. What's the hymn writer's response to that when he sees the cross and he understands who's dying there? He says, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt and all my pride. He says in verse number three, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Verse number four, he understands something of this love that is so amazing, so divine. He says, this demands my soul. It demands my life. It demands my all. All because he saw the cross. Let's stand together, please, as we sing the words of 480.
thank thee tonight for the love of Jesus Christ, love that is so amazing, so divine, love that demands our souls, our lives, our own. We think of one who said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, no sacrifice could be too great for me to make for him. Or another who said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Lord, may our lives be surrendered to thy will, to Jesus Christ who loved us and who gave himself for us. Part us now with thy blessing and take us our separate ways in safety. Remember the youth meeting just now as well. Lead us on with thyself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.